Hi, welcome to this course. My name is Maximilian Schwarzmüller and I will be your instructor in this course. Now in this course, we're going to explore JavaScript data structures and we're going to do this step by step and in great detail. We're going to start with all the built-in data structures, sets, maps, arrays, objects, but then we're also going to dive into a lot of custom data structures which we can build on our own. Think like stacks and queues and trees and binary search trees and priority queues and heaps and graphs and there's a lot of content in this course. We're going to get there step by step and I will explain what problems, which kind of problems these data structures solve. And of course you will learn how to build those data structures and how to work with those data structures on your own. Now this course does have one prerequisite. You need to know about JavaScript algorithms, you need to know about time complexity. So for example, if you took my JavaScript algorithms course before this course, you will be well prepared to get the most out of this course as well. And with that, I'm super excited to get started. I hope you are too. Let's dive in. So let's dive into the obviously most important question. What exactly are data structures in programming and why do we need them? Data structures simply allow you to manage data. So data structures are the things in your code that allow you to store and retrieve and delete and in general manage data. Examples in the case of JavaScript, but actually for most programming languages would be arrays, objects, maps, sets, something like this. Now, just to make it clear what I'm talking about, again, referring to JavaScript here. So this is the JavaScript syntax. Arrays, where you store a list of data, like a couple of numbers or a couple of strings, that's a data structure. Objects, where you group data together into one object and where you, for example, have a string, the name of a person and the number, the age of a person grouped together in one object. And then, lesser known, I would argue, you also have maps in JavaScript. I'll come back to those. And you have sets. These are the four big data structures, the four main data structures you have in JavaScript. And no matter at which programming language you're looking, you will typically find data structures like that in other programming languages as well maps, sets, arrays, and or lists. That is what you work with in pretty much all programming languages. Now, why do we need such different data structures? Well, first of all, of course, programs, so the code you write, are all about doing something. And for that something, you pretty much always work with data. And that data needs to be managed. For example, also intermediate results, which you might be deriving in your code. And typically, you have tasks that require different kinds of data or different ways of managing data. Here are a couple of common use cases. You might have tasks where you need ordered lists of data and where duplicate data is wanted or allowed. In other tasks, you might not care whether the order of the data is kept and you might not want or need duplicate data. So you might be fine with working with unique values or you might actually want unique values. Then you might have cases where you don't just care about the values and whether they are ordered or not. You might actually want to map them to an identifier. You might want key value pairs of unordered or ordered data. Now, for these different use cases, you would have arrays in the case of ordered lists of data. Arrays in JavaScript look like this. And as a side note, ordered does not mean that the elements themselves must have an order in the sense of being sorted in an ascending or descending way. As you see in the example, this array is not sorted. It just means that the insertion order is memorized, is kept, so that the element five in this example always is the third element in the array and that it doesn't magically change behind the scenes. That is what ordered means here and that's important. Now, if the order does not matter and if you don't want duplicates, a set might be the right choice. A set in JavaScript can be created with the new set constructor and then with the add method, you can add elements to a set. And we'll see how we can work with sets over the next lectures. 
Sometimes you need the key value pairs and for that in JavaScript, you of course have the object that allows you to map data together into one object, to group it into one object and you can assign keys, identifiers of your choice and retrieve the values with help of those keys. And you also have the map which does almost the same thing but I'll come back to the differences between maps and objects later in this course. Now, one quick important note, this course will mainly be about custom data structures. So data structures, which you as a developer build on your own, always in the end, based on what's built into the language. So based on arrays and objects and so on, but then simply enhanced with certain functionalities. That's what this course is about. But in order to make sure that we can dive into all those custom data structures, I start with the built-in ones first, so that it's very clear what a data structure is and how the built-in ones work. Because if that knowledge is missing, it will be hard to derive custom data structures. And with that, let's take a closer look at those built-in data structures so that we fully understand them. And thereafter, I will also give you an example for a custom data structure. So let's start with arrays and let's take a closer look. This is an array. It's a list of comma separated data. In the case of JavaScript, you can create it by using these square brackets, this square bracket notation. Now, there are a couple of important characteristics about arrays. For example, the insertion order is kept. It's memorized by JavaScript. So the element free will always be the second element in this array. And you can retrieve it by index, therefore. You have an index which clearly identifies the position of an element. And that's why the order is important, so that the same index always gives you the same element, unless the element, of course, was replaced or removed. Arrays in JavaScript also are iterable, which simply means that you can use them with the for of loop to loop through all the values in there. In addition, arrays in JavaScript are dynamic, which means that the size of the array, the length of it, adjusts dynamically and automatically. That's not the case for all programming languages. There are programming languages out there where you clearly have to define how long an array should be before you can use it. Not with JavaScript. In the case of JavaScript, an array grows with the number of elements and also shrinks with it. That is important for you as a developer because it makes using it easier, but it's also important for memory management and performance optimizations. JavaScript takes care that it doesn't occupy too much memory, which is why that automatic growing and shrinking of the array is really important. And it's all baked into the JavaScript array, which is awesome. In addition, in the array, duplicate values are allowed. In the above example, we only have unique values, but you would be allowed to have two ones, two threes, two twos, whatever you want in there. And of course, also more than two. Also noteworthy, in JavaScript, you can also mix types in an array. So you can have an array of just numbers, like in the example above, but you could also mix numbers with strings, with objects, even with nested arrays, all in one and the same array. That's all allowed in JavaScript arrays. Now, there is one downside about arrays and about lists of data in general, and that is that the deletion of elements and finding elements can require extra work. And that simply means that it can be a bit more performance intensive and a bit more difficult. Now, let's play around with arrays in code a little bit so that we get a feeling for all those points and you understand what I mean. I have a very simple starting setup here, essentially just two files. It's the index.html file, which is an empty HTML file. The only thing I have in there is this script import to app.js. And that's the file where we're now going to play around with code. We're only going to evaluate some results here in the browser JavaScript console, because this is a obviously very theoretic course. So let's play around with arrays. And for that, I'll have a couple of names here. And as you learned, you can create an array in JavaScript with just square brackets. And in there we can have max, menu, and let's say Julie. So we have three strings in here. Now, as I mentioned, you are allowed to also mix types. So we could easily also add a number in here or even add a nested array if we wanted to. 
In addition, we are allowed to have duplicate values, so I can have max in there twice or three times or how often I want. Now what we can also do is we can access elements by index. So we can access menu with index 1 because the index for arrays starts at 0. Now that's basically all knowledge you should already have, but just to make it really clear, this is important. The index starts at 0, so if we access the element at index 1 with this notation, we access menu. And that's why we can reload here and see menu. Now in addition, arrays are iterable. That means we can use the for off loop to go through all the names here like this, and then for example to simply console lock them or do whatever you want to do with them. This code works because arrays are iterable. If we do that, we see all the names being printed out. Now the size and length adjusts dynamically, and we can kind of see this if I console log names.length here, and then maybe after the loop, we actually add a new element with the push method, which is a built-in method we can call on array objects. And here we add, let's say, Julie again, to really prove that duplicates allowed concept. If we then console log the length again, we of course see that initially we have four and then we have five. Now that does not necessarily mean that now more space is occupied in memory than before, because we don't really see how much space was allocated and maybe JavaScript allocated more space than it needed initially to make it easier to add new elements. But nonetheless, the size also in memory grows dynamically with the number of values. Now about the deletion and finding elements. Of course, if we know the index of an element which we want to retrieve, retrieving it is easy and very fast. But we don't always know that. And sometimes we just know the value and we want to know the index of that element then. Let's say we want to find Julie in there. In that case, we can use names and the built-in find method. Find executes a function on every element in the array and that function should return true if it's the element we're looking for and false otherwise. So this runs on every element and should return true if it's the right element. So here we could check if the element is equal to Julie. Of course, this doesn't make too much sense because this will just return Julie. So here maybe find index is the better example because that allows us to find the index for a value we know in case we, guess what, don't know the index yet. So that would be Julie index. The find method, on the other hand, can be very useful if you have an array full of objects and you want to find an entire object by one value of one property of the object. Now, what's the problem about find index and find and all other find methods you have in JavaScript? Well, this has to go through all the elements up to the element where this then returns true. So in this case, this function which we pass to find index does not just run once for Julie, no. It starts at the beginning of the array and it runs it for max and finds out that this does not return true. Therefore, it runs it for menu and still doesn't return true. And then it runs it for Julie. And that means that if Julie would be the last element, we would go through all the elements in the array just to then find that final element. Now, there is nothing you can do about that, but obviously this is a downside. Not one you can get rid of, but something you should be aware of. Finding elements can be very performance intensive if you have long arrays especially, of course. And for deleting elements, it's pretty much the same. There are various techniques for getting rid of elements in arrays. For example, we can use the splice method. Splice allows us to modify an, uh, an array and remove elements. For example, I could splice the element at index 2 or starting at index 2 and then splice one element from that index on. I could also splice two elements, but I just splice one. And that would simply remove one element after index two. So if I now console log names, you will see that our new array has Julie at the end because we added here, but it does not have the original Julie at third position anymore. Instead, there we have max. And the reason for that is that we removed the element at index two, which was Julie and just that element because we removed one element here with splice. Now, the problem with that is this also can be quite performance intensive because whilst we don't have to look for the element, we have to move all the elements after the element that was removed. Because if we remove Julie, of course, Max has to be moved to the new position 
pre, which is now empty, and any element after max, like Julie, which we added here, also then has to move one place ahead. So all the elements after the element that was deleted have to move. And that again is a lot of work on a lot of elements in the array potentially. That's what I mean with extra work that's being required for deletion and for finding elements. So now with arrays out of the way, a very useful construct for managing lists of data, let's have a look at sets, because sets are also about lists of data, but they work a bit differently. We can create and work with sets like this in JavaScript. We don't have such a shortcut syntax, like with the square brackets for arrays, instead we have to use the set constructor function. And then on the created object, we can use the add method to add items to the set. Now, you already see in this example, there's one important thing about sets, duplicate items are not allowed. You won't get an error if you try to add one, but it also won't be added a second time or a third time. It's just added once. Now, what else is interesting about sets? The insertion order, unlike for arrays, is not stored. So you can't rely on the order being kept. Therefore, of course, you can't access elements with index, but instead you'll have a method for getting access to an element. Sets, like arrays, are iterable though, so you can use the for off loop there, but the order, of course, could be different for different loops, so the order is not guaranteed, that's something to keep in mind. And the size and length is also adjusted dynamically, so just like with arrays, you don't have to worry about that. Now, as I mentioned, duplicate values are not allowed, so in a set, you'll always only have unique values. And there is one other big difference compared to arrays. Deletion and finding elements is more trivial and faster than with arrays. The simple reason for that is that the order does not matter. Sets can internally be managed differently. For arrays, you always have to go through all elements and so on. Now, sets can simply store the data more efficiently internally because the position of a value does not matter. So there is no need to go through all values, it can instead use different techniques for quickly finding a value. The same for deleting. If you delete an element from a set, it doesn't have to move all other elements because elements didn't have a position in the first place. So there is no need to move anything just because something was deleted. Now let's have a look at sets in code as well. For that, I emptied the app.js file and in there, let's create a new set. Let's say a set of IDs and every ID is only allowed once. As I said, we create a set with the new set constructor here and to that constructor, you actually can pass an array of values and then these values would be your initial values in the set. If this array would contain duplicate values, only one occurrence of the value would be added to the set. Side note, just as with arrays, you can have any kind of data in sets though, and you can also have mixed types of data in one and the same set. So here we can, for example, add an ID ABC, we can add the ID one, and we could add other types of data as well. So maybe also BB two. And then let's say we also try to add one again. Now, if we loop through the elements here, because sets are iterable, as you learned, we'll see that there's only one one in there and not two ones. So if we save this code and run it, you see ABC one and BB two. You don't see a second one. Now here the order also looks like the insertion order, but again, it is not guaranteed. So don't rely on the order. The order, however, also shouldn't matter too much because you'll not be able to do IDs one anyways. That's not a syntax that works. If you try that, you get undefined. Instead, if you wanna get a value, you simply call has. Because you have to think about sets differently. You don't retrieve a value from there because it only stores those values anyways. Instead, you only need one piece of information. You only need to know does this set have a value or not? And if it has it, well, then you can use it, right? That's the same as retrieving it in the end. If you know it's part of the set, you got the value. So here we could check if it has ABC. And this will, of course, return true. 
And then in the code thereafter, we could work with ABC, for example, because we know that is part of the set. This is how you have to think about it. Now you can always add new values here with the add method, and you can also delete values with the delete method. If I then console log my IDs set thereafter, you will see this is how it's being printed. Looks a bit like an object. It is an object, but not a normal object, a different kind of object behind the scenes. And what we can see here is that the BB2 value is missing. Side note, console log makes it look like there is a position assigned to every element. Again, that is not guaranteed. The order is not guaranteed at all. Now that's how sets work and sets are there for a great choice if you need lists of data but you don't want duplicate values and you don't care so much about the order and the position. Instead, if you manage something like let's say IDs where you only care about whether an ID is already stored or not, for example, then sets might be a great choice. So time for the official comparison. We got arrays and we got sets. Now in JavaScript, the great thing is you can always use arrays. You can really always use arrays. It's a highly flexible data structure and you can use arrays for any kinds of data. And that's why in probably 99% of all scripts, you only see arrays if you have lists of data. You especially have to use arrays if the order matters and or you want duplicates. Now, it could be worth a thought to use a set, though, if you do not care about duplicates, if you want unique values, and if the order does not matter. And sets can especially actually provide an advantage over arrays if you delete a lot of values and if you often look for certain values. So if you would often go through the entire array to find a value and to validate if that value exists. In such cases, sets can be awesome because they actually provide better performance for that. Now, of course, for short lists of data, that won't matter. But if you have long lists with a lot of data, this performance difference might make a real difference and that combined with the uniqueness, which also could be an advantage in some cases, that might be a reason to use a set over an array. Arrays, however, as I mentioned at the beginning, are your go-to default list, which you'll use in JavaScript all the time. So with arrays and sets, we had a detailed look at our list data structures in JavaScript. So data structures that simply help us with managing lists of data. Now it's time for objects. And an object can look like this. We can create it with this shortcut here, with this shorthand notation in JavaScript with the curly braces. And objects can have key value pairs like name and age, which store a string and a number. But objects also and that is important to keep in mind, can have methods attached to them. They can have functionality that's part of the object, like this greet method, which then in turn is actually able to interact with the key value pairs, with the so-called properties of the object. Now, objects in general are unordered key value pairs of data. The element access is done with help of the key name, so of the property name, for example, to get the age value, you use age as an identifier. Objects are not really iterable. There is the for in loop, which is built for objects, but you won't be able to use the for off loop. You won't be able to access the values with help of some index or anything like that. Keys are unique, values are not. So every key name must only appear once. You can't have two H properties in the same object. If you do, the second property would simply override the first one, but you can absolutely have the same value multiple times. If you store the number 31 for age and also for old age or some other property name, that would be perfectly fine. Now, one other important thing is that the keys for your properties actually have to be strings, numbers, or symbols in JavaScript. Most of the time, this is all what you want, but it is worth noting that your keys, for example, may not be objects themselves. So it has to be something like name or one or a symbol, but it's not allowed to be an object or an array. 
Now, objects in general therefore can be summarized as data structures or as constructs that can store data, but that also can contain extra functionalities, namely the methods you can add. In addition, of course, it's also worth noting that objects in JavaScript have this prototypes thing, that you can use constructor functions to create objects, and that you got all these extra features on top of objects, so to say. So it's really more than just a data structure. Nonetheless, objects in JavaScript are the main key value store you use whenever you don't need a list, but, well, a key data store, so whenever you want to group data together. Let's also see objects in code, therefore. Again, back in an empty app.js file, we can create our person object, where we have the first name, let's say, which is Max, and the age, which is 31, and hobbies, which is an array, let's say, with sports and cooking. Now, as I mentioned, you won't be able to use the for off loop here and console log the element. If you do that, you will get an error that person is not iterable so that you can't use it. And you also can't access elements by index. This will not give you an error, but instead now this would simply look for a key named zero. And we have no zero key in here. We only have the keys first name, age and hobbies. So therefore this would give us undefined. Now we can absolutely access by key name, so we could enter first name here like this. This is a string key name. We don't have the quotes here, but this is actually the same as adding quotes. You just can omit it. That's simply an extra convenience you have built into JavaScript. But this is a string property name. So here we can access it like this as a string. And now we get access to the max value. But you also certainly know the dot notation which you can use instead. This also is possible. Now, as I mentioned, you are, for example, not allowed to use an array as a key name here. You see, I get an error in the IDE and I get an error in the browser as well. So this does not work here. And you also may not have duplicate key names. You are allowed to do that, actually. You see, I won't get an error here. But what you'll notice is, of course, that if I now access the age property like this, we won't print 31, but simply 32. So age is overwritten. And I guess that makes sense if you think about the fact that we simply have a group of data here. Of course, every identifier may only be used once. Now you can always add new properties to an object with the dot notation, because you are allowed in JavaScript to access property names that don't exist yet. For example, last name, that is allowed. And thereafter, I can console log person and I'll see that new last name. Here it is. So this is something you are allowed to do. And you can delete properties with the delete operator. You can delete person.lastName, for example, or person.age here, for example, to get rid of that. And thereafter, you'll see that person does no longer have an age. Here, we only got first name, hobbies, and last name. So the delete operator can be used to get rid of a property. There are other ways for adding and configuring and deleting properties as well, but you can learn things like that in my complete guide or in the MDN docs. This here is just a quick wrap up and summary about objects so that we are all on the same page regarding objects. Now one very important feature of course is the feature which I already mentioned on the slide. Your objects can have methods inside of them, so you can add functions as values for your properties, and you can use this shorthand syntax here for adding such a method. There, for example, I could console log, hi, I am this first name. And this would print hi, I am max if we execute person.greet like this. So with this, we execute this function, and therefore we see hi, I am max here. This is really special because this shows us that the object is not just a data storage, but that we can actually also add functionality to it. Because this here clearly is extra functionality that interacts with the rest of the data that's in there. So this is more than just a dump data storage. And that's all we need to know about objects for now. Now let's have a look at maps.
Now that we explored objects, let's explore maps. The syntax for using maps in JavaScript looks like this. Just like with sets, we create a map with a constructor function, and then we got certain methods for interacting with the map. Specifically for adding new key value pairs, we use the set method. And there we can use different kinds of keys, including booleans, but also objects and arrays, and I'll come back to that later. And we can store any kind of value for any key. Now the interesting thing about maps is that the key value pairs are actually ordered, so that's a difference to the object. Just like with the object though, we access elements by key. One important difference again compared to objects is that maps are iterable, so you can use the for off loop there. But again, similar to objects is that keys are unique. The values are not, so that's the same as with objects. You must not have the same key multiple times. If you do, you simply overwrite the value that was stored for that key before. Now keys, and that's also an important difference to objects, can be anything. So you can also use reference values like arrays for keys, and that is a difference. Now also another difference is that maps are really meant to be pure data storages. Now behind the scenes, the interesting thing is that of course maps are actually objects because everything in JavaScript in the end is an object, but they're implemented such that the map object, when you use that, really is just a data store. So you can't add extra functionality to it like you can with an object. You could store a function as a value, but that function would not really be able to interact with the other map key value pairs. And that's a difference to objects. Maps really are meant to be data stores. Objects are not really focused to be data stores. Objects are just constructs that also happen to work well as data stores. Maps are just data stores, just that, nothing else. So let's now take a look at maps in code. Again, back in an empty app.js file, we can create our map. Let's say our result data map by calling new map. Now on our result data map, we can now call set to add a new key value pair, like for example, average 1.53. And we can also add another key value pair for example, last result undefined or null. So you can really have different kinds of values in there. Now you can also use non-string number or symbol keys though. That is one important difference. You could, for example, have, let's say an object, a country, which uh, has a name of Germany, and then let's say a, a population of uh, 82 million people, and if you want it, you could use that as a key. You could set country as a key and then store a value for it. For example, 0 0.89, if that would be some result which we want to store for a specific country. And I'll actually name this Germany to be a bit more realistic. So now Germany here is a valid key, even though it's an object. This would not be allowed in objects. In objects, your keys may not be other objects. In maps, this is allowed. Now we can also use for off and loop through result data like this and then simply console log our elements. So let's see what that gives us. If we save it, we see what we get back are actually a bunch of arrays. Every key value pair that's saved in the map is output as an array, where you always have exactly two elements per array. And the first element is always your key name, and the second element is always your value. So that is what's being output here. Now, as I mentioned, if we set the same key multiple times, like if we set average again, then it will simply be overwritten. So now you won't have two key value pairs with the same key, instead you just have one key value pair where the previous value was now overwritten. And we can console log result data here to have a look at it real quick. Here we go. Now we see this average key has this last value which we assigned and the earlier value was simply overwritten. Now with our map, we can do more 
we can, for example, get access to all the values or just the keys if we wanted to. And that gives us new iterables through which we could loop in case we don't want these key value arrays, but we are just interested in just the keys or just the values. We can use get to retrieve a value by key like this because the dot notation and the square bracket notation you have on objects is actually not supported. If I try this here and I try to get my average like that, you will see the first time when I use the get method, I get the value for the second try here where I use the dot notation, I get undefined. I get undefined and not an error because we can use the dot notation because result data is also an object. As I mentioned, everything in JavaScript is an object in the end, but it's not our map object where the data is in. Instead, it's the map object in the sense of a construct in our code. The map data store only gives us access to our data with its built-in methods like the get method. Now, besides the get method, we of course also, for example, have the delete method, which allows us to delete an element by key. For example, delete Germany here by using its key. If I console log result data thereafter, you will see that Germany is missing. Now we only have average and the last result and no longer our object key. Of course, here it's important to keep in mind that if you are using objects as keys, you really have to use the exact same object when you try to delete it. Just replicating the object, so if you would just copy this here and try that, would not work. If we try this code, we see Germany is still in. Here it is, that's our Germany object as a key. And the reason for that, of course, is that objects are reference values. And here we are creating a brand new object. And even though it looks like the other object to us humans, it's a different place in memory. And therefore, this is technically a different key, even though it looks the same. This is nothing map specific. That is how JavaScript works with reference and primitive values. And if that's unclear, Attached to this video, you find an article and a video on reference and primitive values so that we're all on the same page there. That's it for maps though. That is what you need to know about maps and what you need to know to progress with the course. Now previously we had a look at arrays versus sets. Now since you learn about objects and maps, we can clearly tell that these two constructs are also related we always manage key value pairs after all. So what should you use, objects or maps? Well, it's a little bit as with arrays and sets. Objects are the way more common data structure in JavaScript because objects are super versatile and super easy to use. You have to use them if you want to add extra functionality, like a method that's able to interact with the other data stored in the object. Maps, on the other hand, are really just focused on data storage. They don't have this extra functionality thing. But the advantage maps could have over objects is that they can simplify and actually improve data access compared to objects. So when we talk about retrieving and deleting key value pairs, we have these convenient methods and depending on the kind of data you're storing and on the amount of data you have in your object, maps can also be quicker. They can be faster than objects. However, just as with arrays and sets, this will really only matter if we talk about huge objects with tons of data in there. Therefore, most of the time, you're going to use objects in JavaScript. It's uh, good to be aware of maps though, because you can actually use them if you just need a key value store, if you don't want any extra functionality in there. And uh, in such a case, maps might be worth a closer look. Now that we had a look at arrays, sets, objects, and maps, we got all the basics that we need for this course to finally also dive into custom data structures. However, not before I at least also briefly touch on weak sets and weak maps. We learned about set and map. Weak set and weak map are simply variations of set and map. The difference to set and map is that in the weak set and the weak map, the values in the case of the weak set and the keys in the case of the weak map are only weakly referenced 
Now that's an abstract term. It simply means that the JavaScript garbage collection, which is part of the JavaScript engine, part of the browser for example, is able to actually delete values or keys and their values if those values or keys are not referenced anywhere else in your app. So if you for example have a set and you got a bunch of IDs in there, and JavaScript finds out that nowhere else in your code you're using that value anymore. In such a case, it frees up that space in memory. And therefore, weak sets and weak maps can give you an extra memory advantage because unused space can be cleared up. In a traditional set or map, and also in traditional arrays and objects, such space is not cleared up. The values are kept around forever as long as your array and object exists basically, no matter if you still use a value in an array or not. Now again, in a lot of scenarios this won't matter, but if you have a really performance intensive application that uses a lot of memory, if you're building your own framework and you need every piece of optimization, then weak set and weak map could help you with memory management. Now, we won't need them in the course here, and arguably you won't need them in a lot of applications you're going to build probably, but still, it is worth knowing them, and since we talk about data structures here, I certainly can't move on without at least mentioning them. With that, however, let's finally dive into a custom data structure. So now we explored the built-in data structures you have in JavaScript. This course, however, of course is not focused on those built-in data structures. You already know these and you'll learn about them in every JavaScript course, like in my JavaScript The Complete Guide course. Instead, this course is about custom data structures and that's why now we're going to dive into the linked list custom data structure. Our first very custom data structure which we're going to build from scratch. First of all, before we build it however, let's understand what it is and how it works. And we'll then later also explore why we might need or want this custom data structure and what sets it apart from the built-in ones. A linked list in the end, as the name implies, is a list data structure. So a bit like an array. We can store values in there values of any kind, for example numbers, strings, objects, whatever you want. And in a linked list, the interesting thing is that you don't work with indexes as in an array, and you also don't just have unique values like in a set, but instead every element in the linked list does not just know its value, but it also has a pointer at the next element in line. And that continues. So a linked list, and that's where the name comes from, is a list full of elements that are linked to each other. So every element knows about the next element in line and only about that element. An element does not know about the element in front of it. So for example here, high knows nothing about five, high only knows about eight, and that is how the entire list is then structured. So every element knows about the next element. Now why might we want or need such a linked list? Linked lists historically were invented because they were really flexible when it came to resizing the list and for memory management. And even today they bring one important advantage and that is that the insertion at the start and also typically at the end of the list is very efficient more efficient so than in an array. But again, I will come back to that comparison later. So that is a linked list and how it should work. How could we now implement such a linked list? How could the code for such a linked list look like? Thereafter, once we have that code, we'll compare it to the array and again, come back to the question why and when you might want to use a linked list. So let's write our first custom data structure, a linked list. Now a linked list is a data structure of course, this entire course is about data structures and therefore unlike in my algorithms course, we're now not just going to write some function that does something because we're not just going to write the solution for a problem, instead we want to store data and that has one important implication. In this course, 
the data structures we're going to build will build up on the core data structures that are built into JavaScript. Obviously, because if that would not be the case, well, we would have to build up on the language with which JavaScript is implemented. And ultimately, we could go all the way down to machine code, right, if we want to reinvent the wheel. So that's not what we're going to do. Not that we could easily do it in JavaScript, but that's not what we want to do either. Instead, we'll take what JavaScript has, arrays, objects, and so on, and we'll enhance this. We'll enhance this to build a new data structure on top of those built-in ones, to then, with our new data structure, use those built-in ones in a better way, to then enhance those built-in structures such that our custom data structure does a certain thing in a better way. Otherwise, there would be no reason to come up with a custom data structure if it would do just the same thing, right? So in the case of the linked list, we're also going to build up on some built-in data structures, and then we're going to enhance those with a certain functionality. Now, therefore, we're not going to write a function because a function is basically there to execute code, right? To, to solve a problem, to take some inputs and produce a result. Instead, a data structure, of course, is in the end, in JavaScript, an object. Even arrays are objects in the end, right? So we're going to build our custom object here, therefore. And specifically, I will build my own class here so that we have a blueprint for our custom data structure and we can simply instantiate our class to then have a new instance of our custom data structure. And I think that should make a lot of sense because if you recall the recaps about sets and maps, there we also created a new map or a new set with the constructor function. So those built-in data structures also in the end are just constructor functions and therefore just classes behind the scenes, you could say. And by the way, for objects and arrays, it's not that different. We have those shortcuts with the square brackets and the curly braces, but ultimately we can create an array with the array constructor function, and we can also create an object with help of the built-in object constructor function. So that's all how JavaScript works, and that's what we're going to utilize here as well. So I'm going to create a class, and I'll name it linked list because we're going to build a blueprint for a linked list object so that we later can build as many different linked lists as we want based on this blueprint. That's what classes are there for. So what do we want to do inside of this linked list class? Well, we should add a constructor function because the constructor function in a class is the first code that executes whenever you later call new linked list. So that is when we want to construct a linked list, linked list one. That is what we want to be able to call later. And of course, therefore, when we do that, something should happen. And that something, when new is used, well, that goes into the constructor function. Now, to get an idea for what we want to do in the constructor function, let's again have a look at how a linked list should look like in the end. We have these elements in there. And we also typically call those elements in a linked list nodes. So when you hear me say node, I mean an element in a linked list. So we have these nodes. In this linked list example, we have four nodes. And to help us with efficiently inserting new nodes, at least at the end and the beginning of the list, we also typically keep track of the first node, which is called the head node, or just head, and the last node, which is called tail node or tail. So we have nodes in the linked list and we got two specific nodes or two specific markers which we want to place and which we want to keep updated. And that's the head marker, which always points at the first node in the linked list and the tail marker, which always points at the last node in the linked list. And we'll need head and tail to make sure that we can efficiently prepend and append elements to the linked list. So nodes, head, and tail. These are a couple of important terms. Now, in the constructor, initially we have no nodes because initially when we just created the linked list, it's an empty linked list. So therefore, you could imagine that here you want to, for example, add a nodes property to our class and set this to an empty array, right? That is something that could come to your mind. You want to add this empty array and in this array, you later want to manage the nodes. 
We could do this, but if we do this, we're back to basically just rebuilding an array. We would just wrap the built-in array with our own object. And chances are that we don't really have a much better data structure thereafter. Maybe we can improve it in some parts, but ultimately, I don't just want to rebuild an array here. Instead, the idea will be that we don't store the entire list anywhere. We just store our different nodes and every node knows about the next node, but every node itself does not necessarily know something about the list it's part of. And the list also doesn't know all its nodes. Instead, the list should know the first and the last node of its list elements. And the nodes themselves then know about the next one in line. So there is no place where the entire list is stored. It's just implicitly stored because a list knows its starting and ending value and every value then knows the next value in line. That's the idea of a linked list. And therefore we won't have a nodes property here. Instead we'll have our head property, which I add with this head. And initially that's null because initially we have no head property. And I'll add the tail property, which also is null initially. And that will be the first element of the list. And that here will be the last element of the list. Initially both is null because initially we have no elements. Of course you by the way could tweak the constructor to accept a starting and ending value if you wanted to, but here I'll start simple and not allow this functionality. So this is now my linked list constructor. Not too exciting. Right now it's an empty list. Now let's make sure we can add something to the list. So therefore we probably want to add an append method. And this is how we can add a method in a class. Append should take a value and that value can actually be of any kind, we don't care, can be a string, can be a number, can be an object, can be an array, everything is allowed, it should be some value, and that value should be added to our linked list. Therefore, here I then want to create my new node, you can of course name this constant however you want, and that should always be an object. Now why is new node an object and not just a value? because you have to keep in mind that every node knows about the next node in line. Every element knows about the next element. So it's not enough to just store the value. We also need to store a pointer at the next element in line. Otherwise it's no linked list. Otherwise it's a standalone value that doesn't know anything. And since our list also doesn't know all values, all values would be lost in the end. So therefore it's not enough to just store the value. We want an object instead. And this can be a very trivial object though. It would have a value property which holds the value we're getting. So this is the name of the property. This is the name of this parameter we're getting, which value we're then storing as a value for the value property. Okay, that's a lot of values, but I think value is a name that makes sense here. So we have value stored as a property with the input value we received here. And then that's important, we'll also add another property which is called next. And this should point at the next element in line. Now, of course, initially, right now, we have no next element, right? So this can simply be null, because if we just append a new element, append means that it's added at the end of the list, and naturally, such an element never has a pointer at some next element, because it's the last one in the list, there is no next element. So therefore, this is our new node, which we want to create, and this node should then be added to our list. Now, what does that mean, however? We're not managing the list as an array, so we don't do this list push or anything like that. That's not what we do because we have no list in its entirety. Instead, appending means that we now need to go to the previously last element, so to our tail, and we need to update the next value on the tail and make sure that the next value of our previous tail node now points at this new node. That is what we need to do. So for this, we should reach out to this tail and then to the next property of the tail and set this equal to new node. So basically our new node is now stored in the next property of the previously last node. 
And once we updated the next property of our old tail, we can overwrite the tail property of this constructor with our new node. Now, this does not mean that we replace the old tail object in memory. The old element that was our tail previously still exists in memory. It's just that in this linked list object, we store a new value for the tail property. This does not delete the old object, which was the tail previously. It's just not tied to the tail property anymore. That's why this order here matters, because here we still reach out to the old tail and update the old tail's next property. And thereafter, we replace the old tail in the linked list with our new node. Now the element which was our tail previously still exists and the next property of that previous tail element also still points at the new node. So that is not overwritten by this line. Now of course this implementation has one flaw. Initially tail is null, so reaching out to the next property will fail. So we should actually check if we have a tail before we try to do so, before we try to edit our old tail. If we don't have a tail, so basically if our list is empty, then of course we don't want to update the tail because then there is nothing to update. So if we don't have a tail yet, it's enough to just set the tail to the new node. We always want to do that, but we only want to update the old tail if we have one. We also of course want to set our head equal to the new node if we don't have a head yet, which would be the case if the list is still empty. So I also want to add another if check and check if we have a head property and if we don't have it, hence the exclamation mark, if head is falsy, so if it's null for example, then I want to set this head equal to the new node as well. Typically, when we append a value, the head should not be updated because the head is the first value of the list and appending means that we add it at the end. But if the list is empty, if it has no element yet, if both head and tail is null, then of course the head should also be updated. Because then we just added the only new element to this list. So now the list has exactly one element. And of course that element then, if it's the only element, is both head and tail. So this is kind of a special case. So this is now an append function that should do the trick. Now in order to see whether our linked list and its append function works, we also certainly want some method in our linked list that outputs all the nodes so that we can print it to the console, for example. And that's something we're going to implement next. To output our list, we could add a toArray method. The toArray method would convert our list to an array. Of course, with that we lose the advantages, but that's just a method we can call if we, for example, want to have a look at all the elements we got, or if we simply need to convert it, because we now need an array to continue. That still allows us to use the linked list advantages when we need them, but we can easily pull out all the elements and convert them to an array with that method if we need that. So toArray should basically go through all nodes and then add all nodes to an array and ultimately return that array. So here I'll have my elements array, which is empty initially, and I'm going to populate with a loop now where we go through all the nodes. Now how would you go through all the nodes here if you have no property that stores all nodes? Well, you got the head and the tail, right? So we can just start at the head and the head will be a node that has a next property, which points at the next node. So all we need to do is we need to start at the head and then look at the node which is in its next property and then basically do the same for that node which is in that next property and look at that node's next property and so on. So we drill into all those nodes that are connected to each other. And doing that is rather simple. We can start with our current node here, which is this tail, because we want to start at the first element. And then we can utilize a while loop to go through all the nodes. Because as long as we have a current node, so as long as this is truthy, which of course would not be the case if it's null, so if it's an empty list we would automatically stop, but as long as it's truthy, so as long as we have some object here, we'll continue looping. So we access the tail, if this is an object we make it into the while loop and in here I will now reach out to my elements and push cur node to this array. 
so that I add this node element to the array. And thereafter we of course have to replace cur node with a new node and that is simply cur node.next. So now we have a look at the next property of the current node and that node which we find there is now our new current node. If that should be null, we'll simply stop because then this is falsy and we won't continue with the loop. If it's not null, because it's an object, because it's a node, we'll continue. And therefore ultimately at the end we can return elements here. And with that we should be able to look into our linked list. And therefore now we can have a look and see whether it works correctly. We can reach out to our linked list here and call append a couple of times. Append 1 and then also append hello there and append max my name and maybe append true to also have a different value and then also a, a number like this. And once we did all of that I'm going to console log linked list 1 to array. And this should now console log an array which should contain all those values. And if we get this array, this proves that our linked list works, otherwise we would not be able to get all those values because we get those elements, these values which we want to output by going through our linked list nodes. So let's save that and head over to the browser. And I get an array, but actually it only has one element. And that element is simply the last element I added. So clearly something is wrong about this linked list. Well, it's a simple error. I always talked about the fact that I want to start at the beginning of the list. And yet I used this tail. Of course, there should be this head. Head is the start of the list, not tail. So this head. And if you do that, indeed, you should get your array with all the nodes. And you see, for every node, there is the value, but then also next, which holds the next node in line. So for the first element, for example, next points at the object with hello there, and indeed that is the next object here. And that continues all the way to the last node, which then has a null value for next because there is no next element to point at. So our linked list works thus far. We are able to append elements. We are now also able to output those elements with two array. Now, of course, we don't have all the functionalities we typically want. We also want to be able to prepend an element. We want to be able to delete an element. We want to be able to find a specific element as well, probably. And therefore, we should absolutely add more functionalities. Now, let's continue with prepending elements and absolutely try this on your own first. Here's a quick pause, which you have now to pause the video and give this a try on your own. Thereafter, we'll implement this prepend functionality together. Were you successful? Let's add prepend. Append, add something at the end. Prepend also takes a value, but it should add this value at the beginning of the list. So how could prepend look like therefore? Well, again, we want to create a new node and that new node will be exactly the same node as up there. So we can copy that code and create our new node like this. This node is always the same. Our nodes always have the same structure, of course. Now the insertion logic differs. We want to add it at the beginning of the list now, not at the end. So therefore, what we of course know is that we'll overwrite the head which as we learned is the first element of the list. Now even I learned it. We want to override the head with our new node. We don't need to save or do anything with the existing head first, because of course we might already have a first element, because overriding it like this, again, will not remove the existing head object from memory. It just means that it's no longer stored specifically in a property of the linked list, but the object that was the head previously still exists in memory. However, of course, we need to do one thing to not lose it eventually. Because right now, indeed, the old head would not be used anywhere in our code and therefore ultimately JavaScript garbage collection would pick it up and get rid of it. And to avoid it, the structure of our new node should be the same, but the next value will not be the same as in the case when we append it. When we append a new node, it's always the last element of the list, therefore next always is null. If we prepend, an element, then next should not be null. Instead, next, of course, will be 
Well, the element that previously was our first element, so this head. So before we overwrite head with the new node, we want to take the old value that was stored in head, the previously first node of the linked list, and store that in our next property of the new node, so that the new node is aware of the node that previously was the first element of the list. Since the new node will be the new first element of the list, it should of course be aware of the element that previously was the first element, because that will make the previously first element the second element effectively. So with that, we update this and we store the old first node, the old head node. And with that, we're almost done here. There's just one thing left to do. We also want to check if we maybe are dealing with an empty list. So if we had no head and if we had no tail. If that's the case, if we don't have a tail, so if the list is empty, if this is the first element we add and we simply decided to do this with prepend instead of append, then I want to set the tail equal to the new node as well. Because then tail and head both is the same node because it's the first node we ever added to the list. And that is it. With that prepend should work. And we can test this. Here we are appending a bunch of values. Now at the end here I will prepend a new value and I'll name it first value. And this should now indeed be the first value because I prepend it. To array still should work. No changes should be required there because the logic for going through the entire list is still the same. And if we now reload, therefore we see first value here. And we see that the next value of the first value indeed is the value 1 here and that is the next value. So that all works. 1 also still points at the correct next value thereafter. So prepend seems to do its job. Now let's explore how we can delete elements. Adding elements is good, but sometimes you also want to get rid of elements. So therefore we want to add a delete method, which also should take a value that we want to get rid of. Now deleting is a bit more complex than adding elements, because to delete an element we first of all have to find it. And chances are that the value that should be deleted is not always just the tail or the head. In addition, since we just get a value here, of course we want to find all occurrences of that value and delete it. So if I for example added max twice here to my list and then I print it here and thereafter I call linked list delete max like this, I expect that if I print it again, both occurrences of max were deleted and not just one of them. So that's something we also have to ensure, that delete really finds all occurrences, no matter where they are in the list and no matter how often we have that value in the list. So what do we want to do in delete therefore? Well first of all there is a simple check we should implement. We should check if we maybe don't have a head, so if we don't have a first element. If we don't even have a first element, we know that the list is empty. And in that case I can return null here as a result. You can also return nothing if you want to. In the end you just want to return here to make sure that no other code in this method executes. Because if the list is empty, deleting does nothing. Alternatively, if you wanted, you could also throw an error and let the user of your list handle it. Whatever you want. I will just return here. Now assuming that we do have a head element, so assuming that the list is not empty, we should again loop through the entire list just as we do it with to array and find all nodes that should be deleted. So therefore again we can implement our current node here and start at the head element, so start at the first element and then add a while loop where we essentially, well, keep on looping as long as we have a current node. Now in this while loop we now theoretically need to do two things. We need to check whether the current node has the value we want to delete but that's then not all. We also want to check if the next node in line maybe is the one we want to delete. We want to again go through all the nodes that need deletion. Now what does deleting mean in the context of a linked list though? It actually simply means that we take the next value of a node and instead of letting it point at the next value it previously pointed at, we simply skip that value and point at the, well, value thereafter in line. So if you wanted to delete one, for example, this node here, if we wanted to delete the node with value one, we should be able to find out that 
this is not the first note, of course, because it has a value of first value. But then it's the next note thereafter. We can determine this by looking at the next property of the first note. Now we see the value here for the next note is the value we want to delete, let's say. And therefore, we now want to update next on the first note with the note after the one we want to delete. And this effectively deletes the node with value one because we remove the pointer at this node and therefore it's lost in memory. No one points at it anymore. We have no other place that would point at this node and therefore eventually it will be garbage collected. That is what deleting nodes means in linked lists. So therefore in our deletion loop here, I actually don't want to look at the current node itself here. I want to look at the next node in line here and compare that next node's value. Now by doing that, we're not checking the current node itself's value, which is a flaw, which we'll fix, but we'll simply start at the second node for now. And I'll take care about the first node and so on later too. But with that, we look at the next node in line and check if that node's value is the value we wanna get rid of. For that, we can simply add a if check in the while loop and check if current node dot next dot value, so the value of the next node in line is equal to the value we got as an input. If that is the same, we know we wanna delete that next node. And how do we delete it? Well, as I just said, we update current node next Keep in mind that current node is an object. So if we update its next property, we're doing this on the node object itself because it's a reference value. So we're not just doing this on some variable which cloned the value. No, it's one and the same object in memory. So we're then updating the next property of the current node with the node that comes after the node that should be deleted. And how can we get access to the node after the next node? Well, by accessing the next node, and then the next property of that node. This gives us access to the node after the node that should be deleted. And by storing that node after the node that should be deleted in the current node's next pointer, we effectively delete the next node in line because no one is pointing at it then. Now we also of course have the else case that the next node in line is not a node we want to delete. And in that case, we just update current node with current node dot next. So that's now the same logic as we had it down there when we went through all the nodes in our list. That simply means we move on to the next node and have a look at that node's next value. Can take a while to wrap your head around this, but hopefully I could make the core logic here very clear. You can always, of course, throw in some console log statements if you want to get a detailed log of what's happening at which point of time. With that, we're always looking at the next nodes and we delete them by not pointing at them anymore, but we skip the very first node of our uh, linked list because we initialize current node with this hat, but then we start by looking at the next node's value. We never evaluate the value of current node. Well, simply because if it's the first value which we want to delete, we have a special case. I want to create a new while loop here where I simply keep on going as long as my head value is truthy. But not just that, but as long as the head is truthy, so as long as we have a head value and this head value, so the value stored in the head node, is equal to the value I want to delete. As long as that's the case, so as long as the first node is the one we want to delete, I will update my head with this head next. So this means that if the first value is the one we want to delete, we go into this loop and we replace the first node with the previously second node. Now I'm writing this as a while loop and not just as a if statement because theoretically, of course, that new first node could again have the same value as the old first node and therefore that new first node also needs to be deleted. That's why I want to keep on going as long as the first node has the value that should be deleted. As soon as we hit a first node that does not have the value we wanted to get rid of, we'll make it out of this while loop. So this simply is some extra code that ensures that we get rid of all head nodes that uh, might have the value we wanna delete. Now after this while loop, we will also need to add some special code 
because whilst this while loop will delete all nodes that need to be deleted, we want to update our tail property, this property here, if we happened to delete the last node. So if the last node was a node that needed to be deleted with the while loop here, we want to update the tail property so that head and tail always point at valid existing nodes. So therefore here I'll check if this tail.value is equal to the value that needs to be deleted. And in this case, I'll set this tail equal to the last current node we derived, which will be the last node that was not deleted. And with that, we have our delete function. Now let's give it a try. I'm already deleting max here, so both maxes should be deleted. I then also want to delete first value which is our first value because we prepend it here so that we can check whether that really works. And I will also delete 18.51 to see if that last node deletion works correctly. I will also prepend first value twice. So I duplicated this line here to see whether this head loop here really does its job and gets rid of all head nodes that need to be deleted. With that, let's save it. And let's go back. Initially, I print this array here. This is coming from line 75. That is printing my linked list with all those elements in it. And that looks good. And thereafter, we just have three elements in there. One, hello there, and true. Now let's see if that makes sense. We delete max, so these two elements should indeed be deleted. We delete first value, so these two elements indeed should be deleted. And we delete 18.51, so this element also should be deleted. So the remaining elements indeed should be one, true, and hello there in between. So one, hello there, and true. That should be our remaining elements, and that indeed is what we have here. Now let's see if the next pointers were updated correctly. Next on the first element indeed points at hello there. Next at hello there, it indeed points at true. And next there indeed points at null. So deleting seems to work. And with that, we got the functionality to append something, to prepend something, and also to delete something. Now we can add more functionalities to our linked list. One functionality, which I think would make sense as well, is that we can also find a specific value. And with find here, I mean that I want to find the first occurrence of that value. We can, of course, have the same value in the list multiple times, as you see here at the example of max or first value. But I just want to find the first occurrence, let's say. Of course, you could also add other functionalities where you find all occurrences or count how often an element exists in the list. But here, I just want to find the first occurrence. And therefore here, maybe between prepend and delete, but the position doesn't matter, I'll add a find method, which receives the value that should be found. Now, first of all, just as with delete, I'll check if we don't have a head. So if the list is empty, in which case I'll return nothing because we can't find anything if the list is empty. And thereafter, again, we can start with current node equal to this head to then go through all our elements. So here I'll again go through all current nodes so same logic as in to array. I'll go through all the nodes I have here. And I want to check if current node dot value is equal to the value I got here as an argument. If that is the case, I know that I found the node I wanted to find. And then I'll return this current node. Thereafter, we can simply set current node equal to current node next. That is our looping logic we got in the two array method as well. So with that, we check the value of every node. And the first time we find a node with the value we're looking for, we return that node. And by calling return here, of course, we'll then not continue with the loop, will not continue with this function. That is what I mean with finding the first occurrence. We finish after we have at least one hit. If we make it through the loop without finding anything, I'll return nothing, or maybe we simply return null in both cases. So here at the end and in this initial if check, so that we make it clear that we didn't find anything. Let's give it a try. Here, after 
doing all those things here. Let's now call find for max, which we shouldn't find, but then also for hello there, which we never deleted, so which we should find. So let's save that, reload, and we see null here from line 99. So we didn't find max as we expected, but we see a value for hello there, which is the correct node. So that also works. And with that, we also implemented a find method. Now to conclude this linked list, let's build up on the find method and let's maybe add a insert after method. Insert after. The idea here is that we can insert a value, but we specify after which value it should be inserted. So that we also get a second parameter here, the after value. Now, the idea is simple. We find the after value. So we find the node with this value. And if we do find a node, so if this doesn't return null, then we want to create a new node after that old node, after that, uh, well, value we found. For that, let's first of all, check whether we do find a node for after value. So here I will then find my existing node by calling this find this refers to the class, so this find for after value. And this should return null if it doesn't find it or return the first node it found if it did find it. And important, we therefore insert the value after the first node we find, not after every node we find for that value. That's not the functionality we have here. So we find our node here. We wanna check if existing node is truthy, if it's not, there's nothing we need to do because we can't insert it if we don't find the after value. But if we do find that value, if we do get a node for that, then of course we need a new node. So we can copy that code. And now of course the next value of the new node should not be our head, but instead the next value here should be, since we added after the existing node, well, it should be the next value of the existing node because we insert the new value between the existing node and the old next value after the existing node. So here we use existing node dot next. That is the next value of the new node. And we then update existing nodes next value with the new node. So that we basically put new node between existing node and the old existing next node. And this should be all. Let's see whether that works. For that, here, I'm going to add a new call to linked list one, insert after. And let's say after one, so after the first element, I wanna insert something. And after hello there, I wanna insert something. So I wanna insert after one, let's say new value one, and then I want to insert after hello there, new value two. And thereafter, I'll again simply print this entire array. Let's give it a try and reload. Here's our array. And in there we see one is still the first value, but thereafter I inserted new value one and the next value is hello there. So that is the next element, the next node in line. And after hello there, I also inserted new value two. And that's exactly what I wanted. New value one after one, that's what we got here. And new value two after hello there, that is what we got here. So with that, we also have the insert after method. Now you could add more and more methods for counting elements or whatever you wanna do. But I would say we have a decent linked list here. Now with that linked list created, let's take a step back and let's again check what the advantage of this might be and how it actually compares to the array which ships with JavaScript. Where is the linked list better? So why would you want to use a linked list? Now the linked list is a pretty old data structure. It's not a new invention. It's been around forever in programming. Historically, and in other programming languages, the linked list could help with memory management because in other programming languages, you often need to specify the size of an array in advance. 
And that could be a problem, especially if memory is a scarce resource. Now, of course, still, you shouldn't create apps that occupy tons of memory, but memory, of course, was a much bigger issue uh, a couple of years or decades ago. Then linked lists could be helpful because for linked lists you don't need to specify the length in advance and that was one of the primary reasons why linked lists were invented and used. In JavaScript we honestly don't have that problem because the built-in array is dynamic and grows and shrinks with the number of elements. So we don't use linked lists in JavaScript because of memory reasons typically. Instead linked lists can be useful if you do a lot of insertions at the beginning of lists specifically. For arrays, we have the problem that if we add an element at the beginning of an array, we have to shift all other elements by one element. We have to move them by one element. And linked lists are faster than arrays at this because there we don't keep track of the position of elements. We don't have a long list of elements where every element has an index that we need to update. Instead, inserting an element simply means that we add it and store the next element in the next property and that's it. The other nodes don't even recognize that something changed at the beginning of the list. And that's a scenario where linked lists shine. Now, of course, that means that if you never add elements of the beginning of an array, you very likely don't have a use case where you want a linked list. And even if you do, you would have to use a very big array where you add elements at the beginning with a high frequency to really consider a linked list. But that's the thing about data structures. We use them for niche optimizations and the insertion at the beginning would be the main advantage of the linked list. Now, of course, I can just tell you that and my explanations hopefully also make sense. But how would you typically compare or measure something like this? How did we do it in the algorithms course, in case you watched that? How do you in general compare algorithms? Well, with time complexity and the big O notation. And here's a brief refresher even though I will say you should know that before diving deeper into the course. So if time complexity and big O doesn't tell you anything, definitely make sure you go through my algorithms course first. Time complexity is simply how we measure and compare algorithms typically. And we use something which is called the big O notation to express this time complexity in an easy way. If we consider this simple algorithm here, a function that sums up all the numbers up to a number, we will see that the higher the number is we pass in, the longer this will take to complete. And that would, for example, describe a linear time complexity here. This function has a linear time complexity. For a bigger number, we take longer and the extra time we take grows in a linear way. Now we don't just have linear time complexity in programming, besides that we also find constant time, so where the time it takes never changes, quadratic time, where it changes at a faster rate, and all the cubic time and other time complexities. What we typically care about is not the time in milliseconds, because that depends way too much on the underlying device, on other processes that might be running in the background and so on. Instead, we care about the trend, about the growth rate, you could say. And that is what we express with the big O notation. Linear time would be expressed as O of n, constant time O of 1, quadratic time O of n squared, cubic time O of n at the power of 3, and so on. Now, we cannot just use time complexity and big O notation to describe algorithms, though, and to compare them, but we can also use that to compare data structures. We can compare linked lists to arrays, for example. Now, of course, not the data structure as a whole, because that's just something that's being stored in memory. There, we could compare the space complexity. But instead, we would look at the different operations we want to perform, because those operations, of course, again, are functions. And therefore, we can then find out what the time complexities of the different operations are. So, for example, the time complexity of finding and accessing an element. And by doing so, we can find out which operation we are most likely to perform 
And that then allows us to find out whether we want to use an array or, in this example, a linked list. Now with that, what would be the time complexity of accessing an element? Well, let's have a look at our linked list. There, we want to find an element, and for that we can use the find method. What the find method does is, it in the end goes through all the nodes up to the node, up to the value we want to find. So it simply loops through all node elements. Of course, if the element we want to find is the first one, that loop will be done rather quickly, but if it's the last one, then we have to go through all nodes. And therefore, if we want to access one specific node for a specific value, we have a time complexity of O of n. So we have linear time, because we simply need to go through all the elements. That should be rather straightforward, and again, if you're not sure how you derive that, definitely take my algorithms course first, I do explain it in great detail there. Now, how about arrays? Well, if you want to find an element in an array, you also would have linear time because you will also have to go through all the elements in an array. But the good thing about arrays is we have a quicker way of accessing an element if we know the index in advance. We have constant time there. So, for finding elements, indeed, we would have linear time, but if we know the index, we can definitely get to the value quicker with arrays, because then we can just access the element by index, and that takes constant time, because it does not have to go through all other elements. So here, arrays are faster. Now, what if we want to insert something at the end of the list? With the linked list we built, we have constant time, which is super fast. And the reason for that is that inserting something at the end is done with append. Now, since we keep track of our current tail, which is the last element of the linked list, we can just access this tail and add our new node like this. So it's just one operation, we don't need to go through the entire list. You will also find linked list implementations that don't keep track of the tail. Because theoretically, you only need the head, right? You only need the start. And then, since every node knows about the next node, you could go through the entire list with just that information. Storing the tail besides the head is an extra convenience we built into this linked list so that adding elements at the end is faster. If you don't store the tail, we would have O of n as a time complexity here. So it really comes down to how you implemented your linked list for that. Now, for an array, it's always O of 1, because we can simply use the push method to add a new element, and for that, the array is implemented internally, such that it doesn't have to go through all the other elements, because of course, arrays know indexes, they know positions, and they know their current length. So in an array, internally, it's very easy to jump to the end of the array and add a new element. And inserting something at the end also doesn't affect the other elements, therefore it's O of 1 for arrays. Now how about insertion at the beginning, if we add something at the beginning? For the linked list, again, we have O of 1, so we have constant time here. And the reason for that is our prepend method. We simply add a new node here as our head. And that's just one operation. No need to loop through all the other elements, no need to evaluate everything. Therefore, it's O of 1. And here we have the big difference compared to arrays. Here we have the linked list advantage. For arrays, that's O of n. Because when we insert an element at the beginning of an array, all other elements have to be moved one element to the right, so to say. Right? The index of all our elements has to be incremented, because if we add a new element at the beginning, that new element has the index 0. That means that the element that previously was the first one, and which previously had index 0, now needs to receive index 1. That means that the element which previously had index 1 now needs to get 2 and so on. So they all need to be moved. And that's why here the linked list is faster. Now what about insertion at the middle? Well, there in the end, it's search time plus O of 1 for the linked list. And I'll come back to what the search time is in a second. For arrays, it's O of n, 
The reason why it's O of n for arrays is simply that for arrays, if we want to insert something inside of a list, we again have to move all elements thereafter. So the same logic as with insertion at the beginning. Now for searching elements, and that is where the search time comes from, we have O of n in a linked list. It's basically our element access time we had at the top. If we want to find a specific element, and that is what we need to do to insert something in the middle, for insert after, we are calling find after all. If we need to find something, we again need to go through all the nodes until we found the element. And therefore here the time complexity is O of n because we theoretically loop through all elements. And only then we can insert the element. The insertion itself is then O of 1 because there we don't need to update the other elements. But finding the place where to insert it, that takes O of n. For an array, the search time is also O of n because if we don't know the index, if we want to search for an element, and that's the difference to line 1, element access by the way, if we want to find an element and we don't know the index, well then we also have to loop through all the elements to get access to it. This is how we could compare this and therefore we see the linked list really only wins in one place and that's the insertion at the beginning which is of course a very niche scenario. But again, I mentioned it before and I really want to emphasize it. Data structures are for niche use cases or custom data structures are for niche use cases, I should say. You have amazing built-in data structures in JavaScript and in the vast majority of cases, those data structures give you everything you need. But if you, for example, have a scenario where you have a long list and you always add elements at the beginning of the list and you do that quite a lot, then a linked list might be a good alternative. Now it's needless to say that this is not a scenario you will have all the time, but it definitely is a scenario you could face in bigger applications.